Um, so let me start by giving a brief outline of today's lecture. So in today's lecture, we continue to talk a little bit about the top cycle, which we introduced last week. Um, and uh, then we are going further on this escape route, um, and we are going to weaken this expansion consistency condition beta plus even further uh, to gamma, and then see that this ca um, condition characterizes the uncovered set. Uh, very interesting. Uh, social choice function that only depends on the majority relation, just like the top, top cycle does. And at the very end of today's lecture, uh, so maybe it's an extra incentive to stay until the end, um, I'm giving the details for a special Christmas challenge that we are doing over the holidays. So we're having a, a special Christmas challenge, it's like a competition, and you can earn extra credits for your homeworks by, by doing this challenge. Okay, um, now regarding the top cycle, so this is the slide I showed you last time. So we saw that we can efficiently compute the top cycle by first realizing that we can compute the minimal dominant set that contains a given alternative, and then our first naive algorithm just worked by just guessing a starting alternative, computing the smallest dominant set that contains the starting alternative, um, basically by just repeatedly adding alternatives that weakly dominate everything in the current working set. And then um, at the end of the lecture, we realized um, that the set of Copeland winners is always contained in the top cycle, and therefore we can speed up the running time of this algorithm, not by guessing the starting alternative, but just taking a Copeland winner or all the Copeland winners, and then iteratively adding alternatives. So you may have seen this already. I didn't show it to you last week, um, but it was on the uploaded slides. So one way to formalize this algorithm is to have a working set B, uh, we also initialize it with this uh, set C here, which C is just the set of alternatives that have been added in the previous round of the algorithm. And then what we just check is which alternatives dominate something um, um, of the recently added alternatives. So in the beginning it would be the set of Copeland winners. And then we just put all these alternatives that weakly majority dominate something in C into the set C. If no more alternatives need to be added, we are done, and then we can just return the current working set. And if that's not the case, we just add everything in C to the current working set, and then we repeat over and over again. Okay, so that, that would be the simple algorithm for computing the top cycle. Okay, so, so one thing um, that I would like to discuss now at the beginning of, of this lecture is to study a social choice function which takes the maximal elements of the transitive closure of the majority relation. And the simple reason for this is, is that all these impossibility results that we have studied um, are all about cycles in the base relation or non-transitive base relation. So in general, the, the problem that we face in social choice is, is that once we have at least three alternatives, the majority relation can be cyclic and therefore there are no maximal elements. There are no Condorcet winners in general. Um, so a very natural way to just get around this fact that the majority relation may contain cycles is to just take the transitive closure of the majority relation. That just means we make this relation um, transitive by just keeping uh, adding more and more edges until the relation is transitive. Okay, so the transitive closure. Uh, so um, I, I hope you have seen it somewhere else in your elementary math courses. It's, it's usually uh, denoted by just a relation symbol and then just a star on top. And since we last week, we defined this special set here. So this is the set of alternatives that reach Y on some path. Um, and, and therefore, this can be used to define the transitive closure of the majority relation. So we have that X uh, dominates Y using this transitive closure of the majority relation um, if there is some path from X to Y. Okay. So if there's just any path in terms of weak majorities from X to Y, um, then X weakly dominates Y in terms of the transitive closure. So maybe let's look at a very simple example. So let's take, let's take the three cycle. Simplest example um, where the majority relation is cyclic. Okay, and now, so usually when we, so that, that was also something I clarified on the forum, so usually when I talk about the majority graph, I'm depicting the strict part of the majority relation. Now here I'm going to make an exception because we are talking about the transitive closure of the weak majority relation. So let's just here denote um, the weak majority relation in this graph. So therefore we also have these reflexive edges. Okay, so A is weakly majority preferred to itself. Okay, and if we now take the transitive closure, 
uh, we, we are adding arrows um, until the resulting relation is transitive. Okay? So, for instance, um, if we go from A to B and then from B to C, it's not the case that A weakly majority dominates C, so we are adding this edge in order to make this relation transitive. So let's draw the added edges in blue, and therefore we have this edge here, okay? Because, or in other words, there's a path, so, it's, so relations and graphs uh, can be used equivalently when arguing about the majority relations, so whatever you find more convenient you can use. Um, maybe if, it's, if you find it more natural to talk about paths in a graph, then there's an edge from A to C in the transitive closure now because there's a path of length 2 that goes from A to C, namely from A to B to C, and therefore we add an edge here. Okay, and by the same argument, we also need to add an edge from B to A and also an edge from C to B, right? Because for all of these alternatives, for instance, for the last one here, we can go from C to B by going this way here, and therefore we have to edge and have to add an edge here. And all of these edges taken together, so the red ones and the blue ones, they form exactly the transitive closure of the majority relation. Okay, so I, that's basically just repeating what a transitive closure is. Um, and the idea now is, is now that we have a relation which is transitive, well then the set of maximal elements is well defined. Okay, so this basic flaw, if you want to call it that way, that we usually face, that there are no maximal elements, can be easily repaired by just taking the transitive closure. Okay, so it seems like a very natural way to get around these negative results in social choice. Um, just make the relation transitive by adding arrows whenever necessary, um, and then just take the maximal elements of that. And that defines a social choice function, taking the maximal elements of the transitive closure of the majority relation. Now, the interesting thing is that this social choice function that is defined by taking the maximal elements of the transitive closure of the majority relation is a social choice function you already know. It's exactly the same thing as the top cycle. So this theorem here by Depp from 77 has, uh, shows that the top cycle is exactly the same social choice function as the one that you get if you take the maximal elements according to the transitive closure of the majority relation. Um, so it's just another way, and I think that, that is a common theme that I like about many of the functions that we are discussing, and that will also be true for the uncovered set, which we are going to study later today. So there are many ways to define these functions, so they are quite robust concepts. So you, different ideas, just as we had for Kamini's rule, for instance. So for Kamini's rule, I gave you a couple of examples where different ideas led to exactly the same definition of Kamini's rule. The same is tr true here for the top cycle. Um, and al also, if you look at the literature, so there were different uh, people working in social choice theory who had different ideas, and then it converged both to the top cycle. And the funny uh, coincidence here is that some people also take TC to be the acronym for transitive closure rather than top cycle. So it coincides here, which makes it even nicer. Um, okay, and this we are going to show. It's, it's relatively straightforward. Maybe if you already think about the top cycle and how it could be equivalent to the transitive closure, you already have uh, a rough idea of how such a proof might work. Um, it's basically just fiddling around with the definitions. Let's do it here. So we want to show that FTC, the top cycle, for some preference profile in some feasible set is the same as the set of maximal elements of the transitive closure of the dominance uh, of the weak majority relation. Okay. And in order to show the equivalence of two sets, so usually we just take an element of one set, let's call it X, and then we show that this is also an element of the second set. Um, and then we could go the other way. Um, this proof is particularly simple because we have equivalences in all of these steps. So we are starting with an element that is a maximal element according to the transitive closure, and then we show that this is equivalent to certain other statements, and in the end, as the last uh, equivalence step, we will have that X is also contained in F of TC. Okay, so we take some x, which is a maximal element of the transitive closure of the dominance relation. Okay, so first thing that we do now is, is uh, because I said it's really just fitting around with the definitions in the right way. Um, so first we have to remind ourselves, so how will maximal elements be defined? Uh, so maximal elements were defined such that we said that there is no strictly better alternative according to the relation that we are using here. Right? So there's nothing that is strictly better 
than this alternative. And in the case of complete relations, so we had this equivalence, we can alternatively also say that an alternative x is maximal if it is at least as good as any other alternative. Okay, so either you can say there is nothing that is strictly better, or you can say it is, um, it is weakly better than all the other alternatives. So for complete relations, these two notions of maximality coincide. And clearly, the, the transitive closure of the weak dominance relation is, is a complete relation. So therefore, we can just say that x is a maximal element according to this relation if for all other alternatives y, not even only other alternatives, even y could even be x itself, because it's a reflexive relation, we have that x is at least as good as y. Okay, so that's really just the definition of maximality for complete relations. Okay, um, now in the next step, so um, we are going to fill in the definition of the transitive closure here. So we are we're saying that um, this relation is defined by saying that there is some path from x to y, or using the special notation of the set of alternatives that reach y on some path, we can say that for every y, x is contained in the set of alternatives that reach y. Right? So this is this notation that we defined last time. Okay, so this is just the, the set of all alternatives that reach y on some path in the graph. Um, so now, once you have seen this, so if this turns out to be true in the end to be the top cycle, you already see that this is a very nice and, and elegant way of defining the top cycle because this just says um, that elements in the top cycle reach all the other alternatives on some path. And they, they are precisely those alternatives, so they are completely characterized by this property of reaching everything um, on some path. So now we, get, we need to go to the definition of the top cycle. And as you remember, the top cycle was defined in terms of dominant sets. Okay, so dominant sets are sets such that everything in the set dominates everything outside of the set. So therefore, um, here we said we saw. So we had this notation of DOM, which was the set of dominant sets. And then once we have introduced this notation here, we have realized that um, if we just look at those sets for every possible y. This exactly gives us the set of dominant sets, right? Because we said that in order to, so that was what I showed you previously on the slide. So if you wanted to compute this, the minimal dominant set that contains a given alternative, this is precisely how we are going to do it. So we just keep adding alternatives that dominate the given alternative. So therefore, all these sets here taken together for all possible y's give us exactly the set of dominant sets. And therefore, this is equivalent to saying that for every set B which is dominant, so it's contained in DOM A and then the majority relation. Um, X has to be contained in the set. Okay, because uh, here, so these are the dominant sets and this gives us all dominant sets by enumerating over all the possible Y's and X is contained in all of these. And now you're almost there or we are almost there because we have now shown that um, this alternative x has to be contained in all dominant sets. Okay, and we have seen last time that these dominant sets are, are nested in each other, so they're always contained in each other. So if, if an alternative is contained in all dominant sets, it has to be contained in the unique minimal dominant set, okay, because they form a hierarchy. Um, so maybe you remember this bullseye picture that I drew last time um, of this hierarchy of dominant sets. And therefore, we have that x is contained in Tc of Ra. And that already completes the proof, because we have started with an element that is maximal according to the transitive closure, and we have seen that this element also has to be contained in the top cycle and the other way around. So all of these implications here are actually equivalences, so they go both ways.
Okay, so I, I think this is a nice example because sometimes, so maybe when you first saw the, the statement, so when I first motivated that we could use the transitive closure, maybe most of you didn't realize that this, this could be exactly the same as the top cycle, then once you see the statement, you are perhaps a bit surprised. Um, but then once you see the proof, you, you gain more insight into the structure of this social choice function that we are looking at, and now you have an additional justification for, for liking the top cycle because it's just this precisely the set of those alternatives that reach all the other alternatives on some path of majorities. Okay. Oops. I don't know. Whoop. Okay, that's the first. <laughs> okay, I did an iOS update last week, so I guess uh, new bugs. <laughs> um, Okay, so I, I, I hope th so. This proof is is fine, right? Um, so you agree that this these are the same concepts. Um, so w one other consequence of this equivalence is, is is that rather than taking this algorithm that we devised last time, where we first take the Copeland winners and then we just keep adding alternatives, um, we could also take classic algorithms from, from computer science in order to compute the top cycle. So first, one, one thing that we could do is we could take a classic algorithm like the floyd Warshaw uh, algorithm for computing the transitive closure of a relation and then just take the maximal elements of that. But um, alternatively, you can just take um, um, algorithms that compute uh, strongly connected components because if you think of the directed icyclic uh, graph given by the um, strongly connected components of the majority graph, um, then you only need to find the highest um, component within this directed acyclic graph, and that is exactly the top cycle. So there are standard algorithms given here which do exactly that, but we have already found a linear time algorithm last time, so there's not really a need for, for alternative ones, but uh, of course this equivalence could also be used uh, for, get, for getting different algorithms. Um, okay, so now it seems like everything about the top cycle is great, so we, we, we just removed alpha from our conditions of uh, the errors and possibility result. Um, we just left beta plus, which is still the strongest expansion consistency condition in, intact. Um, then we got this very nice complete characterization of the top cycle, just using a couple of weak axioms plus beta plus, so it seems like everything is nice, so maybe this is really like the ideal social choice function. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case, and um, well, that's basically due to the fact that uh, the top cycle is, uh, returns pretty large sets of alternatives, so maybe you've already realized that if you think about random examples that um, in most, for most preference profiles, of course, a statement like this depends on how you draw these random preference profiles, but in most preference profiles, the top cycle will consist of all the alternatives. So it's quite unlikely that alternatives are not contained in the top cycle. Um, but even more severe, um, the top cycle is so large that it can contain Pareto-dominated alternatives. Okay, and, and that's really bad. <laughs> um, and this is like the major drawback of the top cycle and our main reason for continuing to look for, for good social choice functions on this escape route. And maybe this is also a bit of a surprise um, um, to you that the top cycle may actually contain Pareto-dominated alternatives. Um, and the example for this is, is extremely straightforward, so it just needs two voters and three alternatives. Um, let me draw it somewhere here. So three alternatives. ABC and the other voter has the preference relation CAB. Okay, and that's it. So there's only two voters, three alternatives. Um, so in order to show this claim here, we need, of course, that an alternative is Pareto dominated. That's clearly the case in here, right? So A Pareto dominates B. So everybody of these two voters prefers A to B. And now if we draw the majority graph with these three alternatives, um, okay, we have that everybody prefers A to B. Okay, so this, that's not only a majority edge, that's even a Pareto edge. Um, and between the other alternatives, we have ties. Okay, so between A and C, and between B and C, there are majority ties. So basically, so this is a bit reminiscent of the McGarvey construction that I introduced last time, right? Because, um, okay, not quite, because the alternatives A, B are not, yeah, okay, so forget this. Uh, okay, so, but it's, uh, it's a very simple profile, and we have majority ties between A, C, and B, C here. 
And now, if you think about the definition of the top cycle, it's just defined as the minimal dominant set, but these dominances have to be strict majority dominances. Okay, so the smallest set such that, such that everything in the set strictly dominates everything outside. So it, it's, it's not what you may uh, perhaps think that it's only taking alternative A here, because there's a majority tie between A and C. Okay, so the top cycle um, in this um, majority graph is just to take all three alternatives A, B, C. So you, you could also convince yourself about this by using this, for instance, iterative uh, Copeland-based algorithm for finding the top cycle. Um, but the, the matter of the fact is, is that we have three alternatives in the top cycle, A, B, and C, but alternative um, B is Pareto-dominated, and that's bad. Okay. Um, and therefore, this is an example showing that the top cycle has uh, yeah, one major deficiency here. So one thing you may wonder about is that, uh, okay, this particular example uses majority ties. Uh, um, maybe what about if we, if we rule out majority ties, which we are going to do starting later in today's lecture. We will basically rule out majority ties because they are mainly just an annoyance for most of our uh, results. Um, but even if you, uh, if you rule out majority ties, you can find a similar example. That example would, lead, uh, would, ha would have four alternatives and three voters. And you've basically seen that example already on the second exercise sheet, or third exercise sheet, I think. So on, on that exercise sheet, you basically proved an impossibility result using beta plus. So maybe you recall that that, that was a star exercise, I think on the second or third exercise. Um, and that is basically exactly the same statement that we have here, because by beta plus, um, you, you basically just get the top cycle, and the fact that the top cycle violates beta plus can also be interpreted as an impossibility. Um, because uh, one way to phrase this, this failure of the top cycle to satisfy Pareto optimality is that you can say that there is no Pareto optimal social choice function that coincides with majority rule on pairs, because that's what the other axioms do, um, and satisfies beta plus. Okay, so um, there's, there's a way to see this as a, as a negative impossibility result, and that's basically exactly, I think it was exercise 10 okay, on sheet 3, which showed that. Um, okay, yeah, so that's, that's bad news for the top cycle. Um, okay, so here's the profile again. And as I said, so that's the main reason why we keep looking for maybe, so, so now we have taken the strongest expansion consistency condition, and on this escape route we are proceeding further by weakening this expansion consistency condition, and then, for instance, today we will define the uncovered set as the finest majoritarian social choice function satisfying gamma, and maybe beta plus is just too strong because then there are still Pareto-dominated alternatives returned. Um, and if we take a weaker condition, then we will get a smaller social choice function or a finer social choice function. And if the condition is weak enough, then hopefully we will get rid of these Pareto-dominated alternatives. In any case, I think it, it doesn't require an explanation why it's bad to have Pareto-dominated alternatives in the outcome, right? So because, well, there's another alternative. In this case, um, B is among the winners, but alternative A is preferred by everybody, so it should not be selected. Um, so if you're really nitpicky about technical things, you could argue that in this impossibility of arrows, we only needed Pareto optimality too, right? <laughs> so if you see it this way, so everything is still fine because the top cycle does satisfy Pareto optimality for two alternative sets, because on two alternatives, it's just majority rule. Um, so you could argue, okay, so it's still an escape route from arrow because if we're taking the same axioms, so all the axioms are still satisfied that we have an arrow, except that we have just strengthened some and, and weakened another one. Um, but of course, well, if Pareto optimality is, is violated for larger sets than, than two alternatives, in particular already three, um, that's still uh, a major problem. Um, okay, so just in case you're thinking about this at the time, so other ways to fix the top cycle. Um, so for instance, one thing that you could do is to um, first remove the Pareto-dominated alternatives and then compute the top cycle of the resulting majority relation. Okay, so that gives us a well-defined social choice function and that one will definitely satisfy Pareto optimality because it's like a two-step procedure. And interestingly, so this function has some nice properties. So there's a property that we are going to introduce later in this course, um, which is called alpha hat, um, which says that if we are removing an alternative that is not in the choice set, then the choice set should not change. 
Okay, so it's, uh, the top cycle, for instance, satisfies these properties. If you remove something that is not in the top cycle, the top cycle is still the top cycle. So it's invariant under removal of losing alternatives. Um, and this property is also satisfied by this variant of the top cycle where we first delete Pareto dominated alternatives um, and then we compute TC. However, of course, um, if we first delete um, Pareto dominated alternatives and then compute the top cycle, so this function is, is different from the top cycle, and we have seen that the top cycle is the finest uh, function that satisfies beta plus, and it can be seen that this function violates beta plus. So it's, we have characterized the top cycle using beta plus, so once we, we change the definition of the top cycle by this characterization, we will see that it cannot satisfy beta plus anymore, which is unfortunate. Okay, um, so but that basically uh, is everything I wanted to say about the top cycle. Um, unless there are any questions regarding, the yes. Uh, yes, so that's, that's what I basically meant. You can see this as an impossibility, but you have to add extra axioms for that. So it's not that in general um, beta plus uh, is, is, in, is in conflict with uh, Pareto optimality. But if you assume that... Um, so I think it's exactly what you did in this exercise 10, I think it was, um, where you showed that um, if on, on pairs you do majority rules, so you assume anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness too, so as we did. Um, and... Um, right, and then uh, the, as an extra axiom you have beta plus, um, then you cannot satisfy Pareto optimality. Because well, the top cycle is the smallest one, so you always have to be careful that the characterization of the top cycle uses this refinement condition, so it's the smallest one satisfying beta plus. So if you, uh, th there are also other functions which I mentioned last time that satisfy beta plus, which are coarser than the cop cy top cycle. They return larger choice sets. But of course, if the top cycle already violates Pareto optimality, then these coarsenings will violate Pareto optimality too. Um, so therefore, you can. So now I meant two, not not the number two, but it, it, they violate Pareto optimality as well. Um, um, so yeah. So you can see as an impossibility, which uses beta plus and Pareto optimality and these extra conditions. Um, okay, so well, uh, before we talk about the next uh, social choice function, I'm going to like, define several or make several modeling assumptions that will be useful for the rest of, uh, well, not the entire lecture, but for a large part um, of this course. And um, the first thing that we are going to do is we are restricting attention to to tournaments um, and oh, that, that's actually the second th thing and before we are uh, like basically focusing on functions which only depend um, on the majority relation and one reason to do this uh, could be uh, this quote of, of Kenneth Arrow, which is from the thesis where he, where he proved the impossibility theorem. And here he says that one of the consequences of the assumptions of rational choice is that the choice in any environment can be determined by a knowledge of the choices in two element environments. Okay, so, if, so basically what he's saying but is if, if a function is rationalizable, if we can find an underlying preference relation which takes the maximal elements, uh, according to which the maximal elements are chosen, um, that, then that means that um, whatever we choose from a larger feasible set only depends on the choices from two element sets, because we have seen in lecture two, I think, that um, if something is rationalizable, it's only rationalizable by its base relation. Okay, so the base relation is the rationalizing relation if something is rationalizable, so we can just restrict on choices from two element sets. And that, for instance, is true um, for two functions that we have uh, studied already, the top cycle and Copeland's rule. They both only depend on the base relation, um, which in our case almost always will be the majority relation. Right? So both the top cycle and Copeland's rule only depend um, on majority rule. So basically, this is also like these C1 functions um, that, we, that we introduced when we talked about this C hierarchy from Fishburne. And we are going to make this a bit more precise by introducing that a social choice function is binary. And what do we mean by binary? Okay, so we are here quantifying over all feasible sets and uh, pairs of preference profiles. And then we are saying that if for these two different preference profiles, the choices from all pairs of alternatives are exactly the same, then in this, la in this larger feasible set A, the choices for these two preference profiles also have to be the same. 
Okay, so this is just the formal way of saying that if we make exactly the same choices between all pairs of alternatives, then we also have to make the same choice for the entire set of alternatives that we are looking at, the feasible set A. Um, okay, so binariness is just saying that everything only depends on choices from pairs of alternatives. And as I already said, binariness is weaker than rationalizability because if something is rationalizable, it's rationalizable by its base relation. And of course, the base relation only depends on pairwise choices. That's how it's defined. Um, so that's one way of, of weakening this assumption of rationality by just saying that everything should only depend on pairwise choices. And once we have this here, we will usually make the assumption that um, the pairwise choices are given by majority rule. And that will give us the, con uh, the notion of a majoritarian social choice function, um, which is defined as follows. So a majoritarian social choice function is binary, so it only depends on the pairwise choices. It satisfies anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness too. Um, so again, so you're familiar with these conditions already. So these are basically just here to make sure that on two alternative sets, we are doing what majority rule prescribes. Okay. Um, and on, on larger feasible sets, we could do anything. It should only depend on the majority relation. So this is what binariness implies. So this sounds very similar to this class of C1 functions um, that we have uh, discussed a couple of weeks ago. So there, is, uh, only a tiny, uh, there are two tiny differences. So first, C1 functions do not necessarily need to be neutral. So that is something that we assume for majoritarian functions. So here we have neutrality, not only for two element sets, but for, for arbitrary sets. Um, it's just really just a condition that makes many things a bit nicer. Um, and also um, here, a majoritarian function has to make pairwise choices according to majority rule, because here we are invoking maze axioms. Okay, whereas a C1 function, in principle, it could do um, it, it doesn't necessarily need to coincide with majority rule on two alternative sets. Um, okay, so this class of majoritarian social choice functions satisfies three of the error and possibility conditions. So clearly they are non-dictatorial. Um, they satisfy IRA and also they satisfy Pareto optimality too. So not necessarily Pareto optimality in general because we have seen the top cycle violates Pareto optimality, but on two alternative sets, but they are the same as majority rules, so therefore um, Pareto optimality too is satisfied. And so I'm making such a big deal out of these majoritarian functions because it's not only the top cycle and Copeland's rule that we are studying in this uh, class of functions, but the uncovered set that we are studying today will also be an example of this. Um, and there will be further functions called the bank set and the tournament equilibrium set and the bipartisan set. All of these are majoritarian functions. So I'm not claiming that you should completely ignore all information except the pairwise majority relation, but many functions have been defined in these terms only. Okay, um, right. And then this uh, second restriction um, that we are making is that we are finally just restricting attention to, to tournaments, which means that we are ignoring majority ties. So we are assuming there are no majority ties. So we are only looking at preference profiles in which there are no majority ties. So why are we doing this? Um, basically, it's just, again, it's a natural continuation of what we were doing already. So we started in the beginning with weak preference relations, if you remember, and then at some point we, we said, okay, now let's just assume that preferences are always strict because it makes some things simpler. Um, and now we are adding on top of that this extra step um, of um, like disallowing majority ties. Um, because maybe you've already seen that, for instance, if, when we talk about the top cycle or the Copeland set, um, or Copeland's rule, that these majority ties can be a bit annoying, right? So for instance, if you think about Copeland's rule in particular, um, so we had this, uh, this Copeland score function, which gives, gives us one point for every alternative that we strictly dominate and half a point for every majority tie. Okay, so if, if we just rule out um, uh, majority ties, the Copeland score is just defined very easily. It's just the number of outgoing edges in the majority graph. Um, and the same is true for the top cycle. So the top cycle, for instance, um, we needed to be careful to phrase it using um, well, s strict dominances. And also when we, when we argued about this algorithm where we just keep adding alternatives, we needed to use weak majority, the weak majority relation. So many of these things uh, now coincide for, for tournaments and that's why we are making these assumptions. Um, so formally, what we are going to have is we are having a, a new domain of preference uh, profiles. So, if, so D is always our domain of preferences that we are looking at. And now we are defining DT. 
which is the set of all profiles which are still strict, um, so the number of voters may still change, so that's what uh, DLIN star is about. But now we have this extra condition that there are no majority ties, that which means that for every pair of alternatives X and Y, um, NXY is not equal to NYX. Okay, so as I said, so we are mostly making this assumption because things will be much nicer to state without this assumption, but you could also argue that if there's a large number of voters, majority ties become extremely unlikely. Right, if you think about 10 million voters or something, so it's clearly for most natural, um, or for almost all natural distributions of preferences, it's extremely unlikely that there will be exactly a majority tie. And um, yeah, once we make this assumption, so um, then basically the weak and the strict part of the majority relation contain the same amount of information. The only difference between these two relations is, is that the weak relation is reflexive and the strict one is not. Okay, but otherwise, um, so it's, it's basically like the step from weak to strict preferences that we did for individual voters, so there are no ties in the preferences of the voters, and now if you can say that there are no ties in the majority preferences of the entire society. Okay, and, and once we take a profile from this domain, then the strict part of majority rule and some feasible set defines a so-called tournament graph. Um, now note that... Uh, so here, the ordering is that we first have the set of vertices, and then they have the strict part of the majority relation, and you, you have seen these tournament graphs many times before, and I think I've already used also this terminology before. Um, so here, if you, for instance, take this graph, there's an edge from A to B, and we then say that A dominates B, because there's a strict majority in uh, that prefers A to B. Okay, so that's the strict majority graph, the weak majority graph would only contain these reflexive edges for each of these alternatives here. Um, so w one thing, so maybe to give a more formal argument why it's so nice uh, to restrict attention to tournaments, so we had these three different notions of transitivity um, that we introduced, so transitivity, quasi-transitivity and acyclicity, so all three of these coincide once we are working with tournaments. Okay, so they are, they are all the same, so they only differ if we could have indifferences, um, majority indifferences, which we don't have anymore, so they all three of these coincide. And therefore also acyclicity um, and uh, transitivity also coincide. And in particular, uh, a tournament contains a cycle if and only if it contains a three cycle, or bec because acyclicity and transitivity are equivalent to each other. So that means that if a tournament contains a cycle, we only need, we, or we can verify whether a tournament contains a cycle by only looking for a three cycle. Okay, so um, that makes things much easier to work with. Okay, and then these majoritarian functions. So, so far we have two examples. So we have uh, Copeland's rule and the top cycle. And for majoritarian functions, we will rewrite them as functions that map a tournament to a set of the vertices or a set of alternatives, um, because they only depend on this tournament graph. So for instance, rather than writing F Copeland RA, so this is a preference profile, this is a feasible set, um, we are writing CO, which is short for Copeland. So I, all of Almost all of them will have only two letter acronyms, and then this is the set of alternatives, and this is the majority relation. Um, right, and as I mentioned earlier already, so for instance, the definition of Copeland was a bit tedious because if we take into account majority ties, so there are different ways of generalizing this for majority ties. In the case of tournaments, everything is extremely simple because then, for instance, if you look at this tournament here, um, so let's say, so which, which alternatives would be Copeland winners in this tournament here? Okay, so that should be now, it's, it's much more easy if we completely rule out majority ties. Yes? BC, right, yeah. So because B and C have two outgoing edges and the other alternatives have only one outgoing edge and that's it, okay. So alternatively, because in tournaments everything, uh, so there's an edge between any pair of alternatives, you could also say the Copeland winners are those alternatives with the lowest number of incoming edges. That's completely equivalent in a tournament. Okay, so C and B have only one incoming edge and therefore they are the Copeland winners. Um, okay, so here this basically summarizes what I said. So when we talk about majoritarian functions from now on, we will assume that the domain is DT, so no majority ties. Um, and this will allow for simpler characterizations and, and more elegant results. So for instance, the characterization of the uncovered set that we are seeing later on is much nicer for tournaments. 
For the top cycle, that was not necessary, so we got this very nice result, even when majority ties were possible. Um, but for the other functions that we are studying, things get a bit ugly if we allow for majority ties. And this is just here, uh, like a terminology th statement. So these majoritarian functions in the literature, they are also sometimes known as tournament solutions, because they are basically just functions that take a tournament as an input and then try to return the best set of vertices according to some measure, right? So um, because the standard notion of maximality doesn't work anymore, so you can also apply this to ma many other contexts. So you, this tournament graph could be like uh, sports teams playing against each other. Um, and then you want to, uh, so of course there could be cyclical outcomes, so A wins against B, B wins against C, and C wins against A. Um, and then you can take, for instance, the Copeland winners, the, t the teams that have the most match wins, you can take the top cycle, so every, all the alternate, or all the teams that have some path of wins to all the other alternatives, um, and everything else that we are going to discuss for these majoritarian functions would also work in other contexts as well. Okay. Um, Right, so there's um, like two little statements um, that uh, we need uh, when we talk about majoritarian functions. Both of them are very simple. Um, so if we have um, a majoritarian social choice function and we have a three cycle in terms of the majority relation, so we cycle from A, B, C to A back, um, so like this one here, so here we have A, B, C, A. So then a majoritarian function, and that's claimed here, from the two element set A, B has to select A. Okay, so that's straightforward, right? Because on two element sets, every majoritarian function has to do as majority rule says. And on a three element set, um, A, B, C, when there is a cycle between A, B, and C, it has to select all three alternatives. So why, why, s why do we have this consequence here? Why do we need to select all three alternatives if the function is majoritarian? Yes? Uh, not quite. <laughs> the, other, the other symmetry condition? <laughs> neutrality? Right. Um, so because we have neutrality, right, so it's, we have to select some of the, um, all of, uh, we have to select at least one of the alternatives. Um, let's say, for instance, alternative A, and then by just renaming the alternatives, a three cycle will remain a three cycle, and therefore we also have to select B, and then we also have to select C, um, and therefore just because this sub-tournament here, ABC, is completely symmetric. Um, we have to select all three. So the, the only other symmetric choice would be the empty set, but that's disallowed. So since we have to select at least one, we have to select all three. Um, and uh, this is also something that might be of interest to you in general. So you might ask yourself, so by using neutrality, um, which is part of the definition of majoritarianness, can we, we can have further statements. It's not only these two here. Um, so for instance, if we think about tournaments that have four alternatives, um, neutrality doesn't give you any implications which say that all four of the alternatives have to be chosen. And that's because of the simple fact that if you have four alternatives, um, we cannot have a tournament in which all the vertices have exactly the same degree. If you think about four alternatives, so in the previous example, or the example that you can still see here on the slide, two alternatives have degree two and two alternatives have degree one. So it's impossible to have what is called a regular tournament where all the alternatives have exactly the same degree. But for an odd number of alternatives, you can do that. So for five alternatives, for instance, there's a so-called tournament called the cyclone, um, where, where, where you just draw the vertices in a, in a cyclic form and then every alternative dominates the next two and is dominated by the previous two on the cycle. And if you complete this, you have a very regular and symmetric tournament and here by neutrality also all five alternatives have to be selected. Um, for seven alternatives, for those interested, um, it's, it's more interesting because there are three regular tournaments on seven alternatives, um, but um, only two of them are completely symmetric um, in the sense that neutrality implies that all alternatives need to be selected um, and the, the, remaining alternate, uh, the remaining tournament on seven alternatives is regular, so all vertices have exactly the same degree, um, but it's not symmetric in the neutrality sense that all alternatives uh, have to be selected and it becomes even more interesting if you have higher odd numbers of alternatives. So this is where there's a close connection between graph theory, in particular the theory of tournaments um, and social choice theory. Okay, so here for these claims, so we've seen first one majoritarianness and second one well, majoritarianness and neutrality, which is part of majoritarianness. 
Um, now, some more notation, yeah. So, so these definitions can be a bit boring, but we have to go through this because it's very useful here. Um, so we will denote the dominion um, by dx, and that's just the set of alternatives y that is majority dominated by alternative x. Okay, so the d of x is just all the alternatives that are dominated by x. And similarly, the dominators d bar of x are all the alternatives that dominate x. And here it becomes quite useful to, to realize that if we are talking about tournaments, every tournament can be completely partitioned um, into three sets if we fix an alternative A. So we have A, we have the dominion of A, everything that is dominated by A, and we have the dominators of A. And that, that gives us all the vertices in the tournament because between any pair of alternatives, we have, we have one edge in this tournament graph. So this is uh, clearly a very simple fact, but it will be useful in many cases. Also, uh, in the second half of today's lecture, we are going to use this in a proof. So every tournament can be partitioned with respect to some alternative A um, by partitioning it into the alternative itself, the dominion, and the dominators. Okay, so notice that here, here we are using the strict part. So an alternative is not contained in its own dominion or its own dominators. And well, this we can use iteratively for defining paths. So dk is just the set of alternatives that can be reached from x on a dominance path of length k. Okay, and this is just a recursive definition of this. So you reach an alternative in zero steps. Um, um, if you, if, yeah, so x is, is, is reaches x in zero steps. And then dk plus 1 is just defined by all the alternatives that are reached from x and k steps. And then here we are making this extra step. So for all alternatives y, which we can reach from x and k steps, and then we make an extra step by looking at the dominion of, this, of these alternatives y. Okay, so this is just a recursive definition of paths in tournaments. And we can also turn this around by having d bar k plus 1, which is the set of alternatives that reach x on a path of length k. Oh, this here. So this here is the set of alternatives that reach x on a path of length k. And the definition otherwise is completely similar to the one that we had above here. Um, okay, and finally, so we can, we can just take uh, something that uh, is, is very useful, for instance, for defining the top cycle, is um, we can just take paths of arbitrary lengths by taking the union for any k here. Um, so d star of x is the set of all alternatives uh, that x reaches in the majority graph. Um, so, for instance, let's just let, let's just do an example. So, if we, for instance, want to have d star of a in this majority graph here, then that would consist of all alternatives a, b, c, d, right? Because a reaches b in one step, it reaches c on this path here, it reaches d on either this path or that path, and it reaches itself in, in zero steps. Okay, so this is how we defined the recursion here. Okay, and this also gives us this definition, which we have already used last time when we talked about the top cycle algorithm. This is the set of alternatives that reach x on some path. Okay, so this is just a, an alternative definition to the one that I showed you last time. Okay, so these are all fairly standard graph theoretic concepts, so we need to have dominions, dominators, and paths of, of certain length. And what do we have else? Ah, okay, so one other thing that we have, which I'm not sure whether you've seen this in the tutorials already. So since tournaments contain very many edges, so between any pair of alternatives there is an edge, so there are several tricks to, to visualize them more compactly. And um, one of the simplest, simplest methods to visualize tournaments is just to omit every edge that goes from top to bottom. So every, every edge that goes downwards is omitted because then it just makes looking at these graphs easier. So for instance, um, so let's, let's just take this graph here. Um, it has A, B, C, D, and maybe let's, let's just have them in the same order as they are on the figure now, and let's just omit all the edges that go, from, from, um, that go downwards. So this one is horizontal, so it still needs to be there. This one goes upwards. This one goes from right to left, and this one goes upwards. Okay, so in this special visualization where we omit edges that go downwards, that would be a representation of the very same tournament. Okay, so these are, and this is really important to realize because previously sometimes 
these non-edges were just majority ties, not anymore. Okay, so when we are talking about when we are saying that this is a tournament, then this just means we are omitting the edge from B to D and the edge from B to C. And now a natural question, of course, is but this doesn't save us many edges. Okay, so at least um, um, this graph has well, two edges less than the representation here, but maybe we can do it a bit nicer. Um, maybe some of you see already how we could do this. Um, the fun fact is, is that if we want to order the vertices on top of each other such that, such that we have to draw only very few edges, that's basically the Kemeny problem, right? So it's feedback arc set. So we want to order the alternatives such that only very few edges go, uh, go upwards. Um, and if you look at this example here, um, you will see that you can't, it's, it's almost the transitive ordering B, C, oops, um, B, C, D, A, and then only this edge is going in the wrong direction, and that means one way to, to depict this graph is to say that we have B, C, D, A, all edges that are going downwards are omitted, and then we just have this single edge here. Okay, so that's a very nice representation of this graph and that graph. So all three of these graphs are the same. Okay, um, so yeah, but this is just a visualization, so that, that helps that helps you like draw tournaments without needing to draw a very large number of edges. Okay, um, if this notation is clear and everything, I would introduce the uncovered set um, as our main social choice function. Here, first the motivation, what we are doing now. Um, so we have seen so this. These are the conditions of errors and possibility. Um, the top cycle was characterized as the finest, uh, the finest social choice function satisfying beta plus and these three conditions. So all these conditions together plus finest gave us exactly the top cycle. Um, now we have also weakened rationalizability or consistency to binariness. And at the same time, we are weakening beta plus to gamma. Okay, so we, we already know that gamma is a weaker notion of expansion consistency, and gamma is perhaps uh, I think I mentioned this a couple of times already. It's, to me, it's always like the the easiest expansion consistency condition to remember because it just says if x is chosen from a and x is chosen from b, then it's also chosen from the union of a and b. So it's a very simple expansion consistency condition, and we will see that using these conditions here. <laughs> we will characterize the uncovered set, which is this new social choice function that we are looking at. All right, and um, the uncovered set uh, was, uh, here we only have a picture of, of Miller because uh, you have seen a picture of Fishburne already. So Fishburne, you've already uh, heard about for this C terminology for C1, C2, C3 functions, and also for approval voting and dichotomous preferences. Um, so Fishburne is a, well-known mathematician, has Erdős number one, for those of you who, who know what this is, um, pioneer in decision theory, and um, Miller is a political scientist um, who's also very well-known and was, for instance, a former president of the Public Choice Society. So they both independently introduced the notion of the uncovered set, which is always a good sign if, if independently two people have the same idea roughly at the same time. And let's see how the uncovered set is defined. So first, just like in the case of the top cycle, we need an auxiliary notion in order to define the uncovered set, and here it's a relation. So given some tournament, we say that x covers y, and this is denoted by x c y, if the following is true, the dominion of y is a subset of the dominion of x. Okay, so that's, a definition, that's the definition of the covering relation. It's just a relation, um, a binary relation for two alternatives, x and y. Okay, so in other words, the dominion of y is contained in the dominion of x, so that just means that everything that is dominated by y also has to be dominated by x. And this subrelation is, uh, as first, it is a subrelation of um, the majority relation, so this is the first thing that you need to realize. So if x covers y, then we also have that x majority dominates y. Okay, so why is this the case? Um, well, here you can clearly see that if, so since we're talking about tournaments here, if x um, does not dominate y, then y needs to dominate x, okay? If y dominates x, then x is contained in the dominion of y. 
Okay, so an X is contained in this set, and then by this definition, it also needs to be contained in this set, but X is not in the dominion of X. So here you can see the, how, how tournaments make things simpler because that basically also shows that alternatively, we could have defined the covering relation by just using um, this uh, weak subset relation. So this is the same. So for tournaments, it doesn't matter which one we take. Uh, the definition is very robust in tournaments um, of the covering relation. So it's a sub-relation of the majority relation, and also it's a transitive relation. So if we have x, c, y, and y, c, z, then um, we have x, c, z. Okay, so that's just the definition of transitivity, and why is this relation transitive? That's straightforward, right? Because of transitivity of the subset relation. Because if we have x, c, y, we have that dy is a subset of dx, and here we have that dy is a... Uh, 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 that dz is a subset of dy, <laughs> And therefore, um, of course, since the subset relation is a transitive relation, um, dz also has to be a subset of dx. Okay, so it's all of this, th that's what I really like about the uncovered set, is extremely simple. So it's a very uh, like, uh, easily defined binary relation, but it's transitive. So it's a subset of the majority relation which is transitive, and that's always good, right? Because the problem, as I said in the beginning of today's lecture, are the cycles or the non-transitivities. In tournaments, these two things are equivalent to each other. Um, so here we just get rid of the cycles by taking a sub-relation of the majority relation which is transitive and therefore we can just take the maximal elements of this subrelation. And that's how the uncovered set is defined. So the uncovered set is just defined by taking those alternatives that are not covered. Okay, that's why it's called the uncovered set. So we have a subrelation which doesn't contain any cycles, so therefore we can just take the maximal elements. So as I said, the definition of the covering relation is extremely robust in tournaments. Um, so alternatively, we could have defined the covering relation by saying that everything that dominates X also has to dominate Y. Just as we did up here, we could even have a weak inclusion here as well. That would also be equivalent. And that basically shows that we have like four different equivalent definitions of the covering relation in tournaments. And I'm emphasizing this here because if we, if we didn't restrict attention to tournaments, all these, conditions, all these conditions would be different, and then there would be different types of covering relations, and those are also studied in the literature. But in, in the context of tournaments, all these different covering relations coincide, which makes things much simpler. Um, okay, now let's just keep this. Okay, and then as I said, the definition of the uncovered set is just we take the alternatives, um, which are not covered, or in other words, we take the maximal elements of the covering relation. So just like in the case of the top cycle, a very easily defined social choice function, clearly it's majoritarian, it only depends on the majority relation, because the dominions only depend on the majority relation. Um, so here I claim that this is obviously a Condorcet extension, okay, that would be like the first property that we would like to check, well, if there is a Condorcet winner, what can we say about the covering relation? So let's say X is a Condorcet winner in some given tournament. What do we know about the covering relation in any such tournament? Okay, I see you, but maybe somebody else. Okay, so let's say X is a Condorcet winner, and Y is another alternative. So Y is not a Condorcet winner. Now, for the covering relation, we need to check whether um, Everything that is dominated by one alternative is also dominated by the other alternative. What does that mean for the covering relation that involves a Condorcet winner? Okay, in that case, you. Yes? Okay, so a Condorcet winner is majority preferred to any other alternative, that's right. And how about the covering relation? So it, it covers all the other alternatives because, well, every, so let's say X is the Condorcet winner and Y is a different alternative. Everything that is dominated by Y 
is something down here, but it's not the Condorcet winner, okay? And X, the Condorcet winner dominates everything. So clearly the dominion of Y will be contained in the dominion of X. Everything that is dominated by Y is also dominated by X for the very simple fact that X dominates everything, okay? So everything is, uh, is contained in the dominion of X except X itself, okay? So that's the only element that is not in the dominion of X. Okay, so therefore it is a Condorcet extension, which is already a nice first thing to check. Um, so this, uh, let me, th that I just mentioned very briefly, so it's again one of these examples where a completely different idea leads to exactly the same concept. So this is something I realized a couple of years ago. So the uncovered set can also de be defined as the Condorcet winners of inclusion maximal sub-tournaments that admit a Condorcet winner. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So in general we have this large tournament. Um, the interesting case is one where we don't have a Condorcet winner. So then we had different methods of, of fixing this. So we can take the transitive closure, we can try to invert edges un, until the, the relation is transitive, which we basically did for Kemeny's rule. Another opportunity would be to just look at the largest sub-tournaments that have a Condorcet winner. Because, for instance, like every one-element tournament has a Condorcet winner. Every two-element tournament has a Condorcet winner. Some three-element tournaments have a Condorcet winner, um, some not because they are three cycles. But in general, this is a well-defined social choice function. We just look at the largest tournaments which have a Condorcet winner. And um, you can convince yourself, I'm not, doing, I'm not proving this here, that this defines a social choice function, which is exactly the uncovered set. Okay, but before we have the break, let's just look at two examples uh, to get some, some more intuition into the uncovered set. Okay, so, so this is... Uh, a tournament on four alternatives, A, B, C, D. And now, uh, before we talk about the uncovered set, so the question would be, so what um, can we say about the covering relation? So which of these edges are covering edges? Okay, because uh, the covering relation is a sub-relation of the majority relation. That means some of these edges here will also be covering edges, and I will just highlight those in red. Okay. Can anybody tell me, uh, or point me at a covering edge in this uh, tournament. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Um, D of D of D is empty, and the empty set is contained in every set, um, and therefore C covers D, A covers D, and B covers D. That's right. So these are three examples of covering edges. Um, now I'm revealing that there are no other ones, so we can, for instance, check. So for instance, why is this not a covering edge? A dominates C, well, but B doesn't dominate C, so therefore this is not a covering edge. Okay, and uh, you, can, you can have similar arguments for all the other ones. Um, and that basically gives you that all these red edges are covering edges, and therefore what would be the uncovered set of this tournament? Maybe you again, So we, since you have identified the edges. Um, so we now take the maximal elements of this red relation. Exactly, right? So A, B, and C form the uncovered set here because all the other alternatives are covered. So whenever something is covered, it's out, um, and everything else is in the uncovered set. Okay, um, one other example. It's the same example like this one here, only that this edge has been inverted now. Um, what would be a covering edge in this tournament? So is, there is at least one. Of course, it could also be possible that there are no covering edges. <laughs> Yes? Okay, C to D. Exactly, right? So this is a covering edge. And the other ones, I don't know, maybe let's check D to B as an example. So um, everything that is dominated by B um, would be A, um, but D doesn't dominate A, for instance. Therefore, this is not a covering edge. And therefore, maybe also you again. So what would be the uncovered set then?
Exactly. Everything except the just like we had, like what we had before. Um, and this is interesting in so far because the top cycle, so these are the very same examples that I showed you last week for the top cycle. So this at least shows that the uncovered set um, can select a smaller choice set than the top cycle. And interestingly, so this is exactly the tournament that you get in this exercise 10 uh, that we had on the third exercise sheet where we were showing that the top cycle violates uh, Pareto optimality. Um, and in this particular example, it shows that the uncovered set doesn't include the Pareto-dominated alternative D in its choice set. So it's, it's, it seems like a promising social choice function at this point. Um, but now let's have a break. So after the break, we are characterizing the uncovered set using gamma. So it's a very, very nice and uh, elegant proof. And um, then we talk about computing the uncovered set. And that's basically everything that's left for today. Before the break, we introduced the uncovered set. And I think by now you had the time to internalize those definitions and you see that um, how the covering relation is defined as a subrelation of the majority relation. And as promised, um, the main result for the uncovered set is a complete characterization just using gamma and majoritarianness. More precisely, Moulin has shown in 86 that the uncovered set is the finest majoritarian social choice function satisfying gamma. Okay, so this is precisely what puts this social choice function on this escape road right below the top cycle. And we are going to prove this statement. And as I mentioned last time for the similar proof for the top cycle where we used beta plus, um, these types of proofs have two different steps. So first we show that every social choice function that satisfies gamma and is majoritarian um, has to, so the choice set of every such social choice function has to contain the uncovered set. Okay, so that's the first thing we show. So whatever the social choice function that satisfies gamma, whatever it returns, it has to be a superset um, of the uncovered set. And then the second step, where I last time said that this is sometimes something you keep, uh, or you, you easily can forget, uh, you have to show that the uncovered set itself satisfies gamma. So we haven't even checked that. So we are now characterizing it using gamma, but I haven't, we haven't even convinced ourselves that it satisfies gamma. And that will be the second part of this proof. Um, maybe one thing before we do the proof. So it's, it's really quite remarkable as it was for the top cycle, not only that the uncovered set can be defined, uh, can be characterized in this way, but also that there actually is a unique finest social choice function that satisfies gamma. Because in, in principle, it would be possible that there is not a unique one. There are several inclusion minimal social choice functions that satisfy this property. But just the fact that, that, is a, that there is a unique finest social choice function satisfying gamma um, is already quite remarkable. And it, it, it's also the uncovered set, which is a, a nice bonus. OK, so let's prove this. So it's the UC characterization, and that's the main theorem for today. So the first thing that we show is that, as I said, so we assume that now let's take a capital letter. So because these majoritarian functions, we will always denote by capital letters like uh, CO for Copeland and TC for top cycle. So let's just just like for social uh, for choice functions. Let's use capital S. So S is a majoritarian function that satisfies gamma. So one nice thing about this characterization is that it only uses two properties, majoritarian and gamma. And then what we want to show is that UC is a refinement of S. Okay, so whatever this function S returns is a superset of the uncovered set. And in order to show this, um, well, just as before, so it's an inclusion from one set to the other. We take something that is in the uncovered set and we show that it's also in the choice set of S. Okay, so we take some alternative A, which is in the uncovered set. Here, by the way, I'm also dropping, as we did for social choice functions, the, here the majority relation. So whenever the, the feasible set is only important, I just write down the feasible set. So we take this A and we want to show that A is in S of A. So and the only thing we know about this social choice function S is that it satisfies these two properties here. And now let me just again draw this figure that I also showed you before the break because I already promised that it's useful for many different things. 
So we know that every tournament can be partitioned with respect to some alternative A to its dominion and its dominators. Okay, so if we fix A, and we just take the A that we have here, which is in the uncovered set, um, then the tournament can be partitioned exactly like this here. And now the first part of the proof will be a general statement that will turn out to be very useful for the uncovered set in many different respects, because by the end of today's lecture, you will have realized that there's an equivalent definition of the uncovered set, which probably most of you will find much easier than working with the covering relation. So it's a little bit like the transitive closure for the top cycle, like in an hour you will see, or in less than an hour, you will see that there, there's, there's another way how to get to the uncovered set, um, which makes it quite appealing. Um, now, the general statement here, so let me just repeat that A is just an alternative that is in, in the uncovered set, is the following chain of equivalences. So if an alternative is in the uncovered set, it means by definition that it is not covered. Okay, so there is no other alternative that covers it. Um, so there is no other alternative X in the feasible set such that X covers A. Okay. So what do we know ab about a potential? So now we say that A is uncovered. So what do we know about the potential alternatives that could cover A? So where do they lie in this figure here? So if something, or in general, so if, if some alternative X covers A, where does it have to be here in this figure? In the dominators of A, of course, right? So if something covers A, it has to dominate because it's a subrelation of the majority relation. So a potential alternative X that could cover A should be somewhere around here. Okay, so we can just rewrite this by saying that for all X in the dominators of A, and now comes the important part. We have to make sure, maybe let me first draw it here. So let's, so these are the possible X's that could cover A. And now if none of these X's covers A, the following has to be the case. So for X to cover A, it would be the case that everything that is dominated by A is also dominated by X. That's how the, cover, the, the covering relation is, is defined. And now if, um, everything dominated by A, it's not the case that X dominates everything by A. It means there has to be some alternative, let's call it Y, down here, which dominates X, right? Okay, so that's precisely the definition of non-covering. Um, so there has to be some Y here such that Y dominates X. So again, let me repeat. So if, if A is uncovered, now we have, because we have to get the quantifiers, Right? For every x up here, so for all x up here, there exists some y down here such that there's an edge from y to x. Because this edge is precisely the witness that a is not covered by x. Because there's an edge going in the, in the wrong direction here. Okay, so th this simple fact um, is, is very useful when working with the uncovered set. So let me first complete this here. So for all such x, there is a y. And the y, of course, has to be in the dominion of A, such that x majority dominates, uh, y majority dominates x. So let me somehow highlight this because we will keep going back to this statement several times. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so we, we keep getting back to this later, but now for this proof here, um, let's look at what we, are, what we need to show here. So we need, to, so A is an uncovered alternative. That means for A, it's exactly the case that for all such X's, there is a Y, which dominates X. And what we need to show in the end is that A is returned by this social choice function S. Okay, and the, on the only thing we know about the social choice function S is that it's majoritarian. Okay, so we only look at majority relations here, so th this is really um, obvious. And that it satisfies gamma. Okay, we need to show that A is returned by S by only using gamma, essentially. 
Okay, and gamma, as you recall, is the definition is, is the condition which says that if some alternative A is chosen from two different feasible sets, it's also chosen from the union of these. And we can repeatedly apply gamma, as we for instance did for Zen's theorem many weeks ago, by saying that if, if A is returned in a couple of different feasible sets, so maybe more than two, then it also has to be returned in the union of all of these feasible sets. So the proof idea for the statement is that we are, now I'm reusing the term covering, but in a different sense. So we are taking this tournament here and covering it with, with little sub-tournaments, in all of which A has to be chosen. Um, and then we use gamma repeatedly by saying that if A is chosen in this sub-tournament and in that sub-tournament and in that sub-tournament, such that in the end, if we take the union of all of these sub-tournaments, we have the entire tournament here. So we are covering this entire set of alternatives using small subsets in all of which A needs to be chosen. Okay, and then by using gamma over and over again, we have that A needs to be chosen from the entire feasible set capital A. Okay, so the proof idea is clear. Right? So we now we only need to find the right subsets um, of alternatives for which A needs to be chosen. Um, okay, so basically what we are doing is, is that, because that completely describes the tournament here, is that we first we take alternatives that are in the dominion of A, and then later the, the trickier part will be taking alternatives from the dominators. But first from the dominion, it's, it's pretty simple, right? Because we can just take any alternative that is in the dominion of A, and then look at the two element feasible set A plus this alternative, let's say Y, as in the figure here, well then A needs to be chosen from A and Y. So that was the statement that we had before the break, that for any majoritarian function in a two element set, we have to pick the majority preferred alternative, and that would be A. Um, so and by this argument, and then using gamma repeatedly, we already get that A has to be selected in this sub-tournament here, right? Because we can just cover it with, with, um, with uh, two element sets. And in this sub-tournament here, A is, uh, a is also a Condorcet winner. And so by, by using gamma, we can already see that a Condorcet winner needs to be selected. Not necessarily uniquely, but by just using gamma, we get that the Condorcet winner has to be among the winners. So the first thing that we show is that for every... Okay, now here it's, it's called X. For every X in the dominion of A, um, A is in S of, and then this two element set AX, simply because um, A dominates X. Okay, so let me, let's write. This is the definition of majoritarianness. Okay, and now comes the interesting part, because now we, we also need to be sure that for every alternative that is up here in the dominators of A, that A is selected in some tournament that contains the dominator A and maybe something else. Okay, we need to cover the rest of this entire tournament here. And with dom dominators, of course, it's trickier because they are better than A, so they majority dominate A. But here we can precisely use this statement here, right? Because if you read it again, for every X in the dominators of A, so for every such X, not only this one here, but any other X as well, we can find a Y down here, such that X, A, and Y form a three cycle. Okay, and that was the second statement in the lemma before the break. So in a three cycle, because everything is completely symmetric, every majoritarian function, because of neutrality, has to select all three alternatives. So I guess some of you already see, at least it looks like that, already see how the proof is now complete, because we have covered the entire tournament with these two element sets and three element sets. Okay, for the two element sets, we just look at the dominion here, and for the three element sets, we look at each of these dominators. For each such X, we find a Y, such that X, A, and Y lie on the three cycle, and then we have covered the entire set of alternatives. And then by applying gamma over and over again, we have that A has to be selected from S of A. Okay, and that's, that's the whole trick of the proof. Um, but I think it's a quite, as I said before the break, a quite nice and elegant proof. So now the second part is that we argue for all X's in the dominators of A. And for those we know, by the yellow part here, that there is some y in the dominion of A, such that A has to be selected from the three element set um, A, X, and Y. Okay, and this is again by majoritarianness. So we even had this as a little lemma before the break. 
So maybe let me draw. So this basically, the sub-tournament that we look at here is just the simple two-element thing, where A is selected. And here we have um, X, which is better than A. And for every such X, we can find a Y, such that this forms a three-cycle. Um, and here also, a is among the winners. So we even, need, we even know that X and Y have to be selected as well, but that's not required. Okay, so we, that's why I'm only highlighting A here. So A is selected in all these three element tournaments. It's selected in all these two element tournaments. And therefore, if we combine these together, since we have covered the entire um, set of alternatives, X has to be returned by this function S. Okay. And yeah, so that shows that every function that is majoritarian and satisfy gamma, satisfies gamma has to return a superset of the uncovered set. And of course, it remains to show that the uncovered set itself satisfies gamma, but in most of these types of proofs, that's the easier part. So the most interesting Part of this proof, I would say, is definitely this thing here. So this line here where we covered everything with these three element sets by just using this, you can, yeah, you can call it the characterization of the uncovered set if you want to. Okay, and how does the second part work? Okay, so here we have to show that UC satisfies majoritarianness and gamma. Okay, so majoritarianness is really just trivial. Okay, just by definition of the covering, the covering relation only depends on the dominions of alternatives. So that's, that only depends on the majority relation. So majoritarianness is easy. Um, but gamma is uh, the thing that needs to be shown now. And uh, what would happen if the uncovered set does not satisfy gamma? If the uncovered set does not satisfy gamma, then it would be possible that an alternative X is uncovered in one feasible set, and it's also uncovered in another feasible set, but it is covered in the union of these. Okay? Um, so we're basically showing this then by contradiction, so we assume um, that gamma is violated. So we assume that there's some alternative X, which is uncovered, oops, uncovered in feasible set A. So A and B are just two feasible sets. I'm not writing down the quantifications here. Um, so X is uncovered in A, and it's uncovered in B. And here we assume that X is not uncovered in A union B. Okay, so how would we imagine such a scenario? So it would, we would have two feasible sets that overlap to some extent, and then we have X here. Um, so if X is not um, in the uncovered set of the union of A and B, so maybe let's write down A and B here, then it means that there is some alternative that is covering X in the union of A and B. Okay, so this alternative could be in A, it could be in B, or it could be in both of these, but it has to be in some set. So let's just assume, um, without loss of generality, that it's in A. Okay, so Y is here. So Y is the alternative that is covering X um, in A union B. And what does that mean? So covering, maybe let's use, uh, again, red. Um, covering means that everything that is dominated by X, okay, that could be this thing here, is also dominated by Y. Okay. Um, and um, the thing is that if we have such an, and Y also dominates X, of course. So if we have something like this, if everything that is dominated by X is also dominated by Y, um, then Y also dominates X in this smaller feasible set A. Right? Because if we just restrict attention to this subset here in which, X, in which Y is contained, then, we, then the dominion of X will only be the smaller set here, only this part of the dominion of X in the larger set. But of course, 
still everything that is dominated by x is still dominated by y. Right? So we have only reduced the dominion of x and y if we just restrict attention to the feasible set A. And therefore, y still covers x. So let me go back to this argument. So if we have that x is, is covered in A union B, it means there is some alternative y such that y covers x. Now we have to be careful when we say that one alternative covers another alternative in which feasible, which feasible set we are talking about because the covering relation can change if we look at smaller feasible sets. Um, y covers x in A union B. And now this alternative y has to be in A or it has to be in B. Um, could also be in both of these, so we can easily assume without loss of generality that y is in A. Okay, but, but then, of course, we have what I just drew in this figure here. So um, the dominion of x restricted to A is also a subset of the dominion of y restricted to A. And then that means that um, y still covers x in A. Okay, and that's a contradiction because here we assumed that x is uncovered in A. Okay, I now realize we could, we could also have proved this directly. So for some reason, I usually end up doing contradiction proofs, but we could also have done it directly. So, if, so the, basically what this argument just shows is that if y covers x in some feasible set, then it's y also covers x in any feasible subset in which both y and x are contained. So the covering relation, so whenever one alternative covers another in a feasible set, then it also covers the same alternative in a feasible subset. But it is possible that new covering edges uh, appear in this smaller feasible set, but everything that was a covering edge in a larger tournament is still a covering edge in a smaller tournament. Okay, so it's, uh, let me just show it so that it fits on, on one screen here. So, because I, as I said, so I think it's really nice. Um, first, we showed that uh, any such social choice function which satisfies majoritarianness and gamma has to return a superset of the uncovered set, and then the uncovered set itself was shown to satisfy gamma, and therefore the uncovered set itself is the unique finest majoritarian function that satisfies gamma. Okay, are there any questions regarding this proof? Okay, if not... Um, let me continue. So in, in the rest of this course, we will, we will also learn about functions that are smaller than the uncovered set. And by this theorem, we know that all these functions have to violate gamma. Right? So any, any refinement of the uncovered set has to violate gamma. That is a direct consequence of this theorem, because UC is already the finest one satisfying gamma. Oops. What? OK. <laughs> Ah, now I know why this quite changed, because I, I updated my slides when I was in my office upstairs, so now it's synced. So one typo less for you. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, since beta plus implies gamma. I think that was an exercise on an early exercise sheet, so we know that beta plus is a stronger property than gamma. We also have that the uncovered set is a refinement of the top cycle. So we really have this hierarchy of functions where the top cycle is a large one and then the uncovered set always returns subsets of the top cycle. Um, so e even if you even if you don't know this implication or don't, if, if you assume you wouldn't know that beta plus implies gamma, it's pretty easy to see that the uncovered set is a subset of the top cycle. Because if you imagine that you have the top cycle somewhere here, the top cycle is the sun-like thing which only has outgoing edges, um, then any alternative x that is here has its dominion completely outside of the top cycle because it cannot point inside of the top cycle, and any y that is in the top cycle here dominates x, and it also dominates everything that x dominates, right? because there's only outgoing edges. Um, so therefore, any alternative that is in the top cycle covers every alternative that is outside of the top cycle. And that already 
gives you an alternative argument for this inclusion here. So the uncovered set has to be a refinement of the top cycle for this simple argument here. Okay. Um, Okay, so th the one thing that we would like to convince ourselves about now, which is like the missing piece, is that the uncovered set also satisfies Pareto optimality, because as we have seen before the break, uh, the top cycle had this major flaw of being able to select Pareto-dominated alternatives. So it would really only be an improvement over the top cycle, not only if it's a refinement, but if it's so fine that it does not contain Pareto-dominated alternatives. Um, and that we are, uh, is what we are showing now. But don't worry, so it's not a proof like this one here, so it's a pretty straightforward proof. So we want to show that UC satisfies, uh, let's just abbreviate this, uh, Pareto optimality. Okay, because then it's really, really um, much better than the top cycle. Okay, and in order to show this, um, well, of course, we need some preference profile in which some alternative is Pareto dominated, so we just assume that all of the voters that we have um, prefer alternative A to alternative B. And now the nice thing about the uncovered set is that it's really based on a binary relation because now it suffices to show that this implies that A also covers B. Because then B will definitely not be selected. Okay? Because uh, the, the uncovered set only consists al uh, of alternatives that are um, not covered. So if a now covers B as well, then B will not be selected and we are fine. Okay, and in order to show that A covers B, we need to think about the definition of the covering relation, so everything that is dominated by B should also be dominated by A. So if we just take some alternative C, which is in the dominion of B, we want to show that this C is also in the dominion of A, and then we are done. That's the only thing that we need. Okay, so and here let's just draw some very simple equivalences. So if C is in the dominion of B, we have that B majority dominates C. Okay, so that's really just the definition of, of the dominion. Um, and now comes the only interesting part of this proof here. Um, what we would now like to conclude is that A also majority dominates C. Okay, because then we have seen that C is in the dominion not only of B, but also in the dominion of A. But why does A need to majority dominate C? Well, we have this Pareto dominance here, right? So everybody prefers A to B, and a majority prefers B to C. And we know that the individual preferences of the voters are transitive. Okay, so we don't know anything about the transitivity of the majority relation, um, otherwise that would all be not be necessary. But we do know that the preferences of the voters are transitive. And if everybody prefers A to B, and more than half of the voters prefer B to C, well then clearly also more than half of the voters need to prefer A to C, right? Um, okay, so maybe let me here emphasize that this implication is because of transitivity of the preferences, right? Because sometimes people get confused and think that we are assuming that the majority relation is transitive. That we are not assuming, of course. So, but the preferences of the voters are transitive. So they have strict transitive preferences, and therefore um, A has to majority dominate C, simply because this majority who prefers B to C, um, is, uh, all, they all also have to prefer A to C because all of these voters prefer A to B, since everybody prefers A to B. Okay, and then here, just to make this a bit nicer, we can also rewrite this by saying that C is in the dominion of A. And that just means that we have shown that C is in the dominion of B implies that C is in the dominion of A. Okay, and that's precisely the definition of the covering relation. Everything that is dominated by B is also dominated by A. So, hence, we have that A covers B. Um, okay, and since B is covered, it's not in the uncovered set. That's what we want to show. If something is Pareto dominated, it's not in the uncovered set. But actually, we have, we have shown something stronger. We have shown that the Pareto relation is a sub-relation of the covering relation. Right, so, B is not in the uncovered set of A, this tournament here. 
So we have, we have shown that the Pareto relation is a subrelation of the covering relation, and the covering relation is a subrelation of the majority relation. So these three relations are nested in each other. So the majority relation is, uh, forms a tournament. Some of these edges are covering edges. Um, and if there are Pareto edges, they are also a subset of the covering edges. Okay. Um, questions regarding this proof? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I think it's, it's simple enough. So the only interesting part is really just happening here, because that's where we assume, where we, where we exploit them that preferences are transitive and that there's this Pareto dominance between A and B. Okay, and that gives us the nice statement that um, the uncovered set satisfies Pareto optimality. There's another nice statement, um, which uh, we have shown a couple of years ago, and that is that the uncovered set not only satisfies Pareto optimality, but it is also the largest majoritarian social choice function that satisfies Pareto optimality. So here by large, I mean exactly the opposite of refinement. Sometimes this is also called the coarsest uh, function. So it's just inclusion maximal rather than inclusion minimal. So um, that basically shows that if we restrict attention to majoritarian functions, as we are doing right now, so the top cycle was not doing well in terms of Pareto optimality, the uncovered set satisfies Pareto optimality, and the natural question would be, is there something in between that also satisfies Pareto optimality? That's not the case. The uncovered set is the largest majoritarian social choice function that satisfies Pareto optimality. And this will be, I think, the star exercise on the upcoming exercise sheet. So, it's, so there are other statements in this paper here, so don't worry that you need to reproduce <laughs> a scientific paper here. It's, it's a relatively simple proof. Um, but it has nice consequences, because since the uncovered set is also the smallest function that satisfies gamma, and the largest function that satisfies Pareto optimality, we can basically bound it from both sides uh, doing this, and then we have that the uncovered set is the only majoritarian social choice function that satisfies Pareto optimality and gamma. Right? So it's, it's the finest with one property and the, the largest with the other property. So if we take both of them together, we don't need anything like finest uh, or largest, um, and then we can just take these two axioms. So that, that directly, so once you have understood this exercise, you have directly an alternative characterization of the uncovered set um, that doesn't use this finest condition, but really completely characterizes it using Pareto optimality and gamma. Okay, um, right, so for the rest of the lecture, um, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to finish early today. Um, well, we have almost Christmas, so I'm, I'm actually grateful that so many of you are, well, not that many, but that some of you for are still here. <laughs> I already uh, said to the others in the break that maybe I should have brought some cookies for those brave of you who are still coming in the last week before Christmas. Um, sorry, I forgot that. Um, but yeah, so the last question for today's lecture is, um, how can we compute the uncovered set? Um, and can we compute it efficiently? So the same type of question that we ask ourselves for the top cycle and previously for Kamini's rule. So for Kamini's rule, we had a negative result. For the top cycle, we had this positive result. It can be computed very efficiently in linear time. Um, how about the uncovered set? So any immediate ideas of how you would compute the uncovered set? If I give you a tournament, uh, I don't know, seven vertices or nine vertices or something, so how how would you compute the uncovered set for that? And would that be efficient? So you can think of what we did for the two examples that I showed you before the break. What did we do there? Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you're a bit hesitant, but you're completely right. So you, we can basically just compute the covering relation as we did in the examples. We can, we can look at all pairs of alternatives and, and when, when we want to check whether X covers Y, we need to check whether uh, the dominion of Y is a subset of the dominion of X. Okay, so, and, and this, of course, we can do in polynomial time. There's only a polynomial, polynomial number of pairs of alternatives. Okay, so it's just um, um, M choose two if, if M is the number of alternatives, so we can just compute the complete covering relation. And once we have the covering relation, we need to take the maximal elements, but that's easy. So we know 
for a fact that the cover angulation is transitive, so we just take all the alternatives that are not covered by something. Um, and then we have computed the uncovered set. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, and that would be an A to the 3 algorithm, where the cardinality of A is the number of alternatives. Um, because, well, for any, every pair of alternatives, which is A to the 2, we need to look at the dominions of each of these alternatives. Um, that's why we have this, this extra A factor there. So the natural follow-up question would be just like in the case of the top cycle, where our first algorithm was also A to the 3, whether this can be done more efficiently, ideally in A to the 2, because as I mentioned last time, that is what I now here call linear time, because the input, the tournament itself, is already quadratic in the number of alternatives. Um, and the funny thing is, it turns out that this is um, well, perhaps possible. <laughs> um, it's not clear yet because there's a nice alternative characterization of the uncovered set that gives us um, algorithms that have an asymptotic better runtime than the one that we just sketched. Um, but nobody knows for sure whether it can be done in, in linear time. And you're going to see in a minute why that is the case. Um, but first, uh, we get this alternative definition um, of the uncovered set, which I also promised you earlier. So I said uh, maybe in an hour or something, you will see an alternative definition of the uncovered set, which once you have seen this, you will think that this is much easier to work with than uh, just uh, working with the cover angulation and checking which alternatives um, are covered and which ones are not. And this is the following statement here uh, from Schepsler and Weingast from 84. So they say that the uncovered set uh, returns precisely those alternatives that reach every other alternative in a path of at most two steps. Okay, so this is why I defined all these extra notations for having paths of length k. So we know that the alternatives in the top cycle reach all the other alternatives on some path. Here we are only talking about short paths. Okay, so some alternatives, so x reaches some alternatives in zero steps, that's x itself. <laughs> So it reaches one alternative in zero steps, that is x itself. It reaches some alternatives in one step, this is precisely the dominion of x, okay, and it reaches some other alternatives in only two steps. So first, if you th see the statement for the first time, perhaps you are surprised that such alternatives actually exist, right? because in general directed graphs, it's not necessarily the case that there's always an alternative that reaches all the other alternatives in at most two steps, if you are not talking about tournaments. But in tournament graphs, there are many edges. Right, between any pair of alternatives, there's an edge, and therefore every tournament graph contains at least one alternative that reaches every other one in at most two steps. And more precisely, um, the set of alternatives for which this is the case is precisely the uncovered set. And maybe the way I described these one-step paths and two-step paths, you already realized that why this would be the case, because we still have this yellow statement um, in the previous proof that I showed you. Okay, so that an alternative is uncovered if for every alternative that dominates the given alternative, we can find something in the dominion such that these form a three cycle. Okay, in particular, we can go down to the dominion and then upwards to the dominators, and then we have just reached this other alternative in exactly two steps. So let me show you again what I mean here. So I'm again talking exactly about this statement here. So alternative A is in the uncovered set. Okay, so that's what we are assuming. Then, of course, it reaches itself in zero steps. It reaches everything down here in one step. So that's easy. Now what the statement here says, so in particular this part here, um, for everything that is in the dom dominators of A, we can find some alternative Y in the dominion such that Y dominates X. So this exactly gives us a two-step path from A to Y and then to X. And this works for all x's up here. Okay, so when I showed you this statement, you could have already realized um, that an alternative is in the uncovered set if and only if, because this is just an equivalence here, if it reaches everything else in at most two steps. So that means also in the previous examples that I showed you before the breaks, these, even these small tournaments where we computed the covering relation with these red edges, we could have just looked at whether an alternative reaches all the other alternatives in at most two steps. And for these four element tournaments, that is pretty straightforward. Um, that is an alternative method for computing whether an alternative is in the uncovered set. One, one other thing that is also interesting is that these three alternatives form a three cycle here, and that means that there's also an alternative uh, statement um, of the covering relation. So an edge is a covering edge um, if and only if it does not lie on a three cycle. 
So that also follows from the very same characterization here. So an edge is a covering edge, if and only if it does not lie on a three cycle. But that's a different thing. So now let's first look at these two step things and um, see how they can help computing the uncovered set. So first, it just helps yourself when you, when you look at tournaments and work with the uncovered set because um, you can easily check whether an alternative is uncovered or not, but also algorithmically. It helps because basically you can check whether an alternative reaches another alternative in k steps by uh, looking at the adjacency matrix of the tournament and then multiplying with itself. So this is something that you may have seen in discrete structures or maybe some other course on graph theory already. Um, so in particular, since we only need to talk about steps uh, um, or paths of length two here, we can take the adjacency matrix and multiply it with itself. And then we get a matrix which just gives us exactly once in the corresponding entries if you reach an alternative in exactly two steps. So, uh, okay, so the graph theoretically, by the way, so these alternatives that reach everything else in at most two steps are sometimes also called kings. So they're also studied in, in tournaments independently from social choice. Um, by the way, so I think this, this two-step principle, for instance, was also discovered independently by a biologist, Landau, I think, who was studying the pecking order of chicken. So he was observing chicken, um, and they had a pecking order. So some chickens are pecking on, on other chickens, so they are superior in their ranking. So, but it's not really a ranking. So this thing is, is not transitive, so there are cycles in there. So basically, this, this pecking uh, by a relation is, is not a ranking, so it's a relation. This pecking relation defi defines a tournament, and then this person observed that there are some chicken which can like, peck every other chicken in at most two steps in the sense that either they peck them directly or they peck another one which pecks the third one. Um, so it's, it's really nice to see that tournaments in general and these concepts that we are studying also have applications way beyond social choice. But now matrix multiplication. Um, so basically we can use this fact to reduce computing the uncovered set to matrix multiplication. So the two steps are the, is, is, is like the bottleneck of the algorithm, which alternatives we can reach in one step and in zero steps, so that's trivial. It basically boils down to matrix multiplication or more precisely to squaring a matrix. Um, so here's an algorithm for computing the uncovered set. So first this matrix, which I mentioned, which we are defining is just that we have a one if there's a majority edge from I to J. So I and J are two alternatives and as there's a zero otherwise. Okay, so that, that gives us a matrix, um, which is defined here as matrix M. And then we just check by which alternatives can be reached in two steps, in one step, or in zero step. So M square just gives us which alternatives can be reached in exactly two steps. If we look at the row of this matrix, I'm going to show you an example. Um, this matrix gives us um, if the alternatives that can be reached in exactly one step. And I is just the identity matrix, so of course every alternative reaches itself in zero steps. Um, of course we could also check this otherwise, but it's, I think it's more elegant to just have it in this matrix here. And then we just return those alternatives for which um, the row in this matrix U here does not contain a zero. Um, okay, I, I'll show you an example on the next slide, but before we get to the next slide, let me talk a little bit about this bottleneck here, which is matrix multiplication. So maybe you have, uh, at least I would think that you have studied matrix multiplication at some point in an algorithms course. And um, there have been some, some recent progresses on, on algorithms for matrix multiplication. So the naive algorithm is um, A to the three, if, if A is the number of um, alternatives in each row and column. So here we are talking about square matrices. And then there's Strassen's algorithm, which was the first one that is, uh, has a runtime below Cubic from the late 60s, I think. Um, and then there is this Coppersmith and Vinograd algorithm, which you perhaps have learned about, um, which has a better asymptotic runtime. And then more recently, there has been more progress on this. So just like last year, um, there's a paper by Alam and uh, Vasilevska williams where they have shown that the, at least to the best of my knowledge, the best algorithm to date takes A to the 2.37286 um, for, for multiplying two matrices. Um, and uh, apparently there's no more efficient algorithm known for, for squaring a matrix, which is a special case that we, are, uh, that we need to deal with here. Um, 
This was an improvement over several, so I, I, I skipped some intermediate steps in here in between. So the first major breakthrough uh, before the Coppersmith and Vinograd, or after the Coppersmith and Vinograd algorithm was this algorithm here. You can already see that you really have to look closely at the exponent to realize that how much better it actually is. Um, I'm mostly mentioning this paper here as well because I think it is like 73 pages or something and it was written by a computational social choice researcher. So she was not um, working on the uncovered set um, because she also had an interest in theoretical computer science independently. She was looking at just optimized algorithms for matrix multiplication and came up with this, but she also did some contributions to computational social choice, which is a funny coincidence. And okay, so both of these approaches are strongly based on Copper, Smith and Vinogard which had this runtime here, so maybe you have seen that one before, because that's basically what you see in a textbook. Um, and yeah, just to make a long story short, so it's experts believe um, that matrix multiplication can be done in linear time, which would be A to the two, because that's again the size of the input here, but we are not there yet. Um, in particular, these algorithms here, including the Coppersmith and Vinograd algorithm, are extremely inefficient in practice. So they, they are only, they are, they are only better than, um, I think even Strassen's algorithm, for matrices that are extremely large, in the sense that they really, they contain more rows and colors than their atoms in the universe. So the constants, the hidden constants here are extremely high, um, which shows you that so this, these asymptotic results can be a bit misleading for some practical statements. Um, there are other examples as well, so for instance, simplex algorithm for linear programming is perhaps something you have heard about where the same phenomenon occurs. Okay, but this is really just a side story because I think it's interesting how closely it's related to state-of-the-art algorithm design, even though it's only of theoretical important, importance here, these improvements. But what we in general can say about the uncovered set is that um, there are more efficient algorithms than the naive one, where we just compute the covering relation and take the maximal elements, because that was uh, A to the three. Um, possibly it can also be computed as fast asymptotically as the top cycle, but nobody knows for sure. Okay, and now I promised you this example here. Um, so see what I, how this matrix multiplication stuff would work. Okay, so this is a tournament with uh, five alternatives, as you can see. Then what we basically need to do, we need to compute this term here. Okay, first, this matrix M, so this matrix and this is just the same one. The matrix M is defined as follows. So for instance here, ah, I guess I should denote how the rows and columns are. So of course this is A, B, C, D, E, and here as well. And that means, for instance, that we have a one here. Oh. <laughs> that we have a one here because, well, there's an edge from A to B. Okay, so there's an edge from A to B. That's why there's a one here. And these matrices are symmetric in the sense that if there's a one here, there's a zero on the other side. And for instance, from A to C, there's a zero because C dominates A and we have a one here. Okay, um, so that's how you construct these matrices. Then you square this matrix um, just using regular matrix multiplication, multiplication your preferred algorithm for this. Um, and then we just add, because in the end, the idea is we want to have a matrix in which an alternative is uncovered exactly if the row corresponding to the alternative does not contain a zero. And why is that the case? We only have zeros here if an alternative cannot be reached in zero, one, or two steps, because we just add these matrices together. So this is just uh, an addition here. So we, we look, how many ways are there to reach an alternative in, um, in two steps? Then we add how many ways are there to reach an alternative in one step, so there can be only one way to do this, and how many ways are there to reach an alternative in zero steps? Exactly, of course, only the identity matrix here, also there's only one possibility, and that means we only need to check here which entries in this matrix are different from zero. So concludingly, so this alternative is uncovered, so it reaches A in, um, yeah, so there's one way to reach, to, to reach A, namely the one in zero steps, so there's two, reach, two ways to reach alternative B. Um, so it reaches B directly, and it also reaches B in two steps. Okay, so this, this is where this two comes from. Okay, and then we don't really care how many different ways there are to reach a given alternative. We only need to know whether there's no way to reach a given alternative. And this is the, um, come on. Okay, so this is, 
the fact down here, so alternative E doesn't reach alternative A in two steps. Okay, so let's check whether this is true. So from E, if you want to go to A, well, E has only one outgoing edge, we can only go to B, okay, and, but then we cannot go to A. So clearly, we cannot reach A in two steps. And here you can already also see this equivalence between the two steps principle and the covering relation. E doesn't reach A in two steps, and this is precisely because A covers E. So this is directly related. A covers E because A dominates E, and everything that is dominated by E is also dominated by A. So th this is the only covering relation here, the covering edge here. And so therefore, the uncovered set um, in this um, example tournament would consist of the alternatives A, B, C, and D. Okay, and now using this, you could do this for larger tournaments as well, but I, I guess that nobody wants to do matrix multiplication for homework exercises, so an, an easier way would be just to check for this two steps principle or maybe compute the covering relation instead and do it directly. Um, but in general, so all of these algorithms run in polynomial time, so we can efficiently compute the uncovered set. Okay. Um,